Thank you for listening to the recording of um, Bed Knobs and Brew 6. Um, it's by Mary Norton and it's illustrated by Anthony Lewis, this particular copy. Um, this is actually a really nice copy. Um, it's got like a kind of um, cotton material on the outside and it's got a nice little ribbon as well, which actually goes all the way around, which is quite sweet. And then I'll just be using this copy. So um, Ben Knobs and Broomsticks is actually made up of two stories. So that's why it's called Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. So it's the Magic Bed Knob, which is what we're going to be reading, and also uh, Bonfires and Broomsticks, which is the second story. Both stories are in this copy, um, so I highly recommend, because this particular one has some really, really nice little illustrations that are started just like little, little chapter style ones. But then they have also like larger full page ones, which I'll show you, because one of the full page ones does actually fall in one of the chapters. Um, so I said we're going to be reading the first three chapters of <laughs> The Magic Bed Knob, which sounds a lot longer than it actually is. They're, they're actually quite short. But it is a really, really lovely little story. And I'm sure many of you know it from the movie that was made of it as well. Um, the movie adaptation was inspired by rather than um, a direct take. But it's also a really, really magical version of it. So, to not drag you into it much longer, um, this is Bedknobs and Broomsticks by Mary Norton. The Magic Bedknob. Just stop. Illustration there. Chapter one, how they met her. Once upon a time, there were three children and their names were Carrie, Charles and Paul. Carrie was about your age, Charles a little younger, and Paul was only six. One summer, they were sent to Bedfordshire to stay with an aunt. She was an old aunt and she lived in an old square house which lay in a garden when no flowers grew. There were lawns and shrubs and cedars, but no flowers, which made the garden seem grave and sad. The children were shy of the house with its big hall and wide stairways. They were shy of Elizabeth, the austere old housemaid, and they were shy of their aunt too, because she had pale blue eyes with pinkish edges, and did not often smile. But they loved the garden and the river, which ran through it and the countryside beyond with its tangled hedges and sweet meadow grass. They were out all day. They played in the barns, they played by the river, and they played in the lanes on the hills. They were punctual for their mills because they were visitors and good children at heart. One day slipped into another and all the days were alike until Miss Price hurt her ankle. And that's where the story begins. You all know someone rather like Miss Price. She wore gray coats and skirts and had a long thin neck with a scarf round it made of Liberty silk and a paisley pattern. Her nose was sharply pointed and she had very clean pink hands. She rode on a high bicycle with a basket in front and she visited the sick and taught the piano. She lived in a neat little house which stood in a lane at the bottom of the garden and the children knew her by sight and always said good morning. In the village there was none so ladylike as Miss Price. <laughs> now one day the children decided to go mushroom picking before breakfast. They awoke almost before the night had drained away from the sleeping house and tiptoed through the hall in their stockinged feet. When they got outside, the garden was still and drenched in dew and they walked with their shoes left like smudges in the pearly grass. They spoke in whispers because it seemed as if the world except the birds was still asleep. Suddenly, Paul stood still staring down the slope of the lawn towards the darkness of the cedars. What's that? They all stopped and they all stared. It moved, Paul told them. Come on, let's see. Carrie sped ahead on her long legs. It's a person, she called back. And then her step grew slower. She waited until they caught up with her. It's, her voice was hushed with surprise. It's Miss Price. And so it was sitting there on the wet ground under the cedar 
Her grey coat and skirt was torn and crumpled, and her hair hung low down in wisps. Oh, poor Miss Price, cried Carrie, running up. Whatever's the matter? Have you hurt yourself? Miss Price looked back with frightened eyes, and then she looked away. It's my ankle, she muttered. Carrie fell on her knees in the damp grass. Miss Price's ankle was indeed the strangest shape. Oh, poor Miss Price, cried Carrie again. And the tears came to her eyes. It must hurt terribly. It does, said Miss Price. Run to the house, Charles, ordered Carrie, and tell them to ring up the doctor. Then a strange look came over Miss Price's face, and her eyes wide, opened wide as if with fright. No, no, she stammered, gripping Carrie's arm. No, not that. Just help me get to home. The children looked at her, but they were not surprised. It did not even occur to them to wonder what Miss Price might be doing so early in the morning in their aunt's garden. Help me to get home, repeated Miss Price. I can put one arm around your shoulders. She looked at Carrie and the other around his. Then perhaps I can hop. Paul watched seriously as Carrie and Charles leaned towards Miss Price. Then he sighed. And I'll carry this, he said obligingly, picking up a garden broom. We don't want that, Carrie told him sharply. Put it against the tree. But it's Miss Price's. How do you mean Miss Price's? It's the garden broom. Paul looked indignant. It isn't ours, it's hers. It's what she fell off. It's what she rides on. Carrie and Charles stood up, their faces red from stooping and stared at Paul. What she rides on? Yes, don't you, Miss Price? Miss Price became paler than ever. She looked from one child to another. She opened her mouth and then she shut it again, as if no words would come out. You're quite good at it, aren't you, Miss Price? Paul went on encouragingly. You weren't at first. Then Miss Price began to cry. She pulled out her handkerchief and held it over her face. Oh dear, she said. Oh dear, now I suppose everybody knows. Carrie put her arms around Miss Price's neck. It was what you always did to stop to people when they cried. It's all right, Miss Price. Nobody knows. Nobody at all. Paul didn't even tell us. It's quite all right. I think it's wonderful to ride on a broomstick. It's very difficult, said Miss Price, but she blew her nose. They helped her to her feet. Carrie puzzled and excited, very excited, but she didn't like to ask any more. Slowly and painfully, they made their way through the garden and down the lane that led to Miss Price's house. The rising sun glimmered through the hedgerows and turned to dust in the roadway to pale bold. Carrie and Charles went very carefully and Miss Price flapped between like a large grey bird with a broken wing. Paul walked behind with the broomstick. So it's the end of chapter one. And there's a lovely picture there of them all helping Miss Price. Chapter two, more about her. Afterwards, on the way home, Carrie and Charles tackled Paul. Paul. Why did you, you tell us that you had seen Miss Price on a broomstick? I don't know. But Paul, you ought to have told us. We have, we'd have liked to have seen it too. It's very mean of you, Paul. Paul did not reply. When did you see her? In the night. Paul looked stubborn. He felt as if he might be going to cry. Miss Price always passed so quickly. She would have been gone before he call out anybody and they would have said to him at once don't be silly Paul besides it had been his secret his nightly joy his bed was beside the window and when the moon was full it shone on his pillow and wakened him it had been exciting to lie there with his eyes fixed on the pale sky beyond the ragged blackness of the cedar boughs some nights he did not wake up other nights he woke up when she did not come, but he saw her often enough and each time he saw her she had learned to fly a little better. 
At first she had wobbled so, balanced sideways on the stick, that he wondered why she did not ride astride. She would grip the broomstick with one hand and try to hold on to her hat with the other, and her feet in her long shoes looked so odd against the moonlight sky. Once she fell, and the broomstick came down quite slowly, like an umbrella blown inside out, with Miss Price clinging onto the handle. Paul had watched her anxiously until she reached the ground. That time she had landed safely. Partly, he did not tell because he wanted to be proud of Miss Price. He did not want the others to see her until she was really good at it. Until perhaps she could do tricks on a broomstick and look confident instead of scared. Once she had been lifted both hands in the air at the same time and Paul had nearly clapped. He knew it was hard to do even on a bicycle. You see, Paul, Carrie grumbled, it was really very selfish. Now Miss Price has hurt her ankle, she won't be flying again for ages. Charles and I may never have the chance to see in her. Later, as they were solemnly eating lunch in the high dark dining room, Aunt Beatrice startled them by saying suddenly, Poor Miss Price. They all looked up as if she had read their secret thoughts and were relieved when she went on calmly. It seems she's fallen off her bicycle and sprained her ankle. So painful, poor soul, I must send her down some peaches. Paul sat with his spoon halfway to his mouth and his eyes moved round from Charles to Carrie. Carrie cleared her throat. Aunt Beatrice, she said, could we take the peaches to Miss Price? It's very thoughtful of you, Carrie. I don't see why not, if you know where she lives. Paul seemed about burst into speech, but he was silenced by a kick from Charles. Aggrievedly, he swallowed his last mouthful of rice pudding. Yes, Aunt Beatrice, we do know where she lives. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when the children knocked at Miss Price's neat front door. The path on which they stood was gaily bordered with flowers and, th and through the half-open windows of the sitting room, Miss Price's dimly curtains fluttered in the breeze. The door was opened by Agnes a village girl who served Miss Price for a few hours daily. As the children entered the little sitting room, for a moment they felt very shy. There lay Miss Price on the sofa, her bandaged foot raised up on pillows. She still looked pale, but now her hair was tidy and her white blouse spotlessly neat. What lovely peaches! Thank you, my dears, and thank your aunt. Very kind of her, I'm sure. Sit down, sit down. The children sat down gingerly on the little spindly chairs. Agnes is making us some tea. You must stay and keep me company. Carrie, can you open that card table? The children bustled around and helped to set the room for tea. A little table near Miss Price for the tea tray and a white cloth on the card table for the scones and the bread and butter. The quince jelly and the ginger cake. They enjoyed their tea. And when it was over, they helped Agnes to clear away. Then Miss Price showed Charles and Carrie how to play backgammon and lent Paul a rather large book full of pictures called Paradise Lost. Paul liked the book very much. He liked the smell of it and the gilt-edged pages. When they had finished their game of backgammon, it seemed that it must be nearly time to go home. Carrie took her courage in both hands. Miss Price, she said hesitantly, if it isn't rude to ask, are you a witch? There was silence for a moment, and Carrie could feel her heart beating. Paul looked up from his book. Very carefully, Miss Price closed the backgammon board and laid it on the little table beside the sofa. She took up her knitting and unfolded it. Well, she said slowly, I am and I'm not. Paul sat back on his heels. You mean you sort of? He suggested. Miss Price threw him a glance. I mean, Paul, she said quietly, that I am studying to be a witch. She knitted a few stitches, pursing up her mouth. Oh, Miss Price, cried Carrie warmly. How terribly clever of you. It was the best thing she could have said, 
Miss Price flushed and she looked pleased. How did you think, how did you best think of it, Miss Price? Well, ever since I was a girl, I had a bit of a gift for witchcraft, but somehow, what with piano lessons and looking after my mother, I never seemed to have the time to take it up seriously. Paul was staring at Miss Price, as if to drink in every detail of her appearance. I don't think you're a wicked witch, he said at last. Miss Price dropped her eyes unhappily. I know, Paul, she admitted in a low voice. You're quite right. I started too late in life. That's the whole trouble. Is being wicked the hardest part? asked Carrie. It is for me, Miss Price told her rather sadly. But there are people who have a natural gift for it. Paul has, said Charles. Paul came nearer and sat on a chair. He was still staring at Miss Price, as if he longed to be asked her something. After a minute, he found courage. Could you do just a little bit of magic for us now? Oh, Paul, exclaimed Carrie. Don't worry, Miss Price. She can't do magic with a sprained ankle. Yes, she could, protested Paul hotly. She could do it lying down, couldn't you, Miss Price? Well, said Miss Price, I am a little tired, Paul, but I'll just do a little quick one, and then you must all go home. There you are. Carrie and Charles looked round quickly, following the direction of Miss Price's eyes. Paul's chair was empty. Paul had gone. But where he had been sitting, perched a little yellow frog. Before Carrie and Charles had the time to explain, Paul was back again, still staring expectantly at Miss Price. Oh, cried Carrie with a gasp. That was wonderful, wonderful. How did you do it? She felt breathless and almost afraid. Magic, a spell. She had seen it with her own eyes. I didn't see anything, complained Paul. Carrie looked at him impatiently. Oh, don't be silly, Paul. You turned into a frog. You must have felt it. Paul's lips trembled. I didn't feel anything, he said in a squeaky little voice. But nobody heard him. Carrie was staring at Miss Price with shining eyes. Miss Price, she pointed out almost reproachfully. You could have done that at the church concert instead of singing. Miss Price laid down her knitting. A strange look crept into her face and she looked hard at Carrie, as if she was seeing her for the first time. Nervously, Carrie drew back in her chair. Although you sing so nicely, she added quickly, but Miss Price did not seem to hear. There was a wild light in her eyes and her lips moved quietly as if she were reciting. There must be some way, she was saying slowly. There must be some way. Some way of what? asked Charles after a moment's uncomfortable silence. Miss Price smiled, showing her long yellow teeth. Of keeping your mouth shut, she rapped out. Carrie was shocked. This was far from ladylike. Oh, Miss Price, she exclaimed unhappily. Of keeping your mouths shut, repeated Miss Price slowly, smiling more unpleasantly than ever. Paul made a little wriggling movement in his chair. Now she's getting wicked, he whispered to Carrie in a pleased voice. Carrie drew away from him as if she had not heard. She looked worried. What do you mean, Miss Price? You mean we mustn't tell anyone that, she hesitated, that you're a witch? put in Paul. But Miss Price was still staring as if she had neither heard nor saw. In just a minute, I'll think of something, she said, as if to herself, just in a minute. Then Carrie did something which Charles thought very brave. She got up from her chair and sat down beside Miss Price on the sofa. Listen, Miss Price, she said. We did try to help you when you hurt your ankle. There isn't any need to use any magic with us, any nasty magic on us. You, not, you want to stop us telling? You could just do it in a nice kind of way. Miss Price looked at her. How could I do it in a nice kind of way? She asked. 
but she sounded more reasonable. Well, said Carrie, you could give us something, something magic. And if we told anyone about you, we'd have to forfeit it, you know, like a game. Directly we told, and the thing would stop being magic. What sort of thing? asked Miss Price, but as if the idea had pos possibilities. Charles leaned forward. Yes, he put in, uh, a ring or something that we could twist and a genie comes out. And if we told about you, the genie wouldn't come out any more. Couldn't you do that? Miss Price looked thoughtful. I couldn't manage a genie, she said after a moment. Well, something like that. Miss Price sat very quiet. She was thinking hard. I know, she said after a while. Suddenly, she seemed quite nice and cheerful again. There's something I've been wanting to try out. Mind you, I'm not sure that it will work. Has anybody got a ring on them? Alas, none of them had. Paul felt in his pockets, just in case, but found nothing but the brass knob he had unscrewed from his bed that morning. Well, anything a bracelet would do, it would be, has to be something that you can twist. But unfortunately, Carrie could not produce a bracelet either. I have one at home, she said, but I only wear it on Sundays. You can twist this, cried Paul suddenly, holding out the bed knob. That's just what it does. It twists and it twists and it twists. I twisted it off. He added rather unnecessarily. Miss Price took the bed knob and held it thoughtfully between her clean bony fingers. Let me see, she said slowly. Then suddenly she looked up as if surprised. Paul, I believe this is the best thing you could have given me. Paul squirmed pleased but bashful. Now, I could do a wonderful spell with this, but I must think it out very carefully. Now be quiet, children, and let me think, so that I can get this right. Her fingers closed gently around the shining brass. It should be very good indeed. Now, quiet, please. The children sat like statues. Even Paul forgot to fidget. A bumblebee came in through the window, buzzed heavily about the room, except for this, and the silence was complete. After what seemed like a long while, Miss Price opened her eyes, and then she sat up blinking and smiling. There you are. And she stepped brightly and handed back the bed knob to Paul. He took it rev reverently. Is it done? He asked in an awe-stricken voice. It looks the same to him. Yes, it's quite done, Miss Price told him. And it's a very good spell indeed. This is something you'll enjoy. Only don't get yourselves into trouble. Carrie and Charles were looking enviously at Paul. What must we do with it? asked Charles. Just take it home and screw it back on the bed. But don't screw it right up. Screw it about halfway. And then? And then, Miss Price smiled, twist it a little and wish. And the bed will take you to wherever you want to go. The children gazed unbelievably at the gleaming ball in Paul's rather grubby fingers. Really? asked Carrie with such a little gasp. Miss Price was still smiling. She seemed very pleased with herself. Well, try it. Oh, Miss Price, breathed Carrie, still gazing at the knob. Thank you. Don't thank me, said Miss Price, taking up her knitting again. Remember the conditions. One word about me and the spell is broken. Oh, Miss Price, said Carrie again. She was quite overcome. Well, now off you go. It's getting late. As I say, don't get yourselves into trouble and don't go gallivanting about all night. There should be moderation in all things, even in magic. Can we move on to the next chapter, some um, pictures to share. So they're actually really nice ones. So it's a nice one of the children and Miss Price in her living room. And also one of Miss Price flying about during the night. Okay. 
we move on to the, uh, the last chapter now. It's chapter three, a false start. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, the children were back again. Their faces were serious and their manner uncertain. Could I, said Carrie to the cheerful Agnes, could we see Miss Price? She gave a little swallow as if she felt nervous. Miss Price is engaged at the moment, replied Agnes. Is there a message? Well, Carrie hesitated. How much did Agnes know? She looked around at the others. Charles stepped forward. You could just tell her, he said, that it didn't work. It didn't work, Repe repeated Agnes. Yes, just say it didn't work. It didn't work, repeated Agnes to herself, as if memorising the message. She disappeared down the passage, leaving the front door open. They heard her knock. Then, after a minute, Agnes returned. Miss Price says you can step in. They were shown once more into the sitting room. Each chose a chair and sat on the edge of it. I bet she'll be angry, whispered Paul, breaking the silence. Shush, said Carrie. She looked a little pale. Suddenly, the door opened and Miss Price limped in. Her foot was bandaged and she wore a carpet slipper, but she was able to walk without a stick. She looked around from face to face. It didn't work, she said slowly. No, repeat, replied Carrie, clasping her hands together in her lap. Miss Price sat on the edge of the sofa. They all stared at each other in silence. Are you sure you did it right? Yes, just what you said. We screwed it in half or halfway and then turned a little and wished. And what happened? Nothing, said Carrie. Paul's eyes, round with, with accusation, were fixed on Miss Price's face. I can't understand it, said Miss Price after a moment. She thought a while. Have you got it with you? she asked. Yes, Carrie had it in a checked sponge bag. Miss Price drew out the golden ball and gazed at it non plus Didn't the bed move at all? Only by Paul bouncing on it. It's rusty here at the bottom, said Miss Price. It was always like that, Carrie told her. Well, I don't know, Miss Price stood up gingerly, putting her strained foot to the floor. I'll take it along and test it. She made to move towards the door. Could we watch you? Miss Price turned back slowly. The circle of eager eyes seemed to hold her. They saw her hesitate. Please, Miss Price, urged Carrie. No one has seen my workroom, said Miss Price. Not even Agnes. Carrie was going to say, but we're in on the secret. But she thought better of it and kept quiet. Their longing eyes spoke for all of them. Well, I'll just send Agnes off with some groceries and then I'll see. She went out and it seemed an eternity before she pulled them. Eagerly, they ran out into the passage. Miss Price was putting on a white boiler suit. In her hand was a key. They followed her down two or three steps into a short, dark passage. They heard the key turn in a well-oiled lock. Miss Price went in first, then stood aside. Quietly, she begged, said, beckoning them in, and careful what you touch. The room must at one time have been a larder. There were marble slabs and wooden shelves above the slabs. The first thing Carrie noticed were the glass jars, each with its typewritten label. Miss Price, a spot of proud pink in each cheek, ran a hand along the rows. Toads, hares' feet, bats' wings. Oh dear! She picked up an empty jar to which a few damp balls of dust still clung. I'm out of newt size. She peered into the jar before she stood it back on the shelf. Then, taking a pencil, she made a note on a memo pad which hung on the wall. They're almost impossible to get nowadays, she said with a sigh. But we mustn't grumble. This is my little filing cabinet where I record my results. Successful and unsuccessful too, I'm afraid. 
My notebooks. Carrie, leaning forward, saw these were stout exercise books neatly labelled. Spells, charms, incantations, she read aloud. And I don't suppose you know any, any, any of you know, said Miss Price brightly, the difference between a spell and a charm. I thought they were the same thing, said Charles. Aha, replied Miss Price darkly, but her face was alight with hidden knowledge. I only wish a spell were as easy as a charm. She lifted a spotless piece of butter muslin and the children peered, not without a shudder, at what appeared to be a greenish slab of meat. It lay symmetrically in a gleaming porcelain dish and smelt faintly of chemicals. What is it? asked Carrie. Miss Price eyed the dish dubiously. It's poisoned dragon's liver she said uncertainly. Oh, said Carrie politely. Paul pushed up close. Did you poison the dragon, Miss Price? Or just the liver? He said. Well, admitted the truthful Miss Price, as a matter of fact, it came ready prepared. It's part of the equipment. It all looks very hygienic, ventured Carrie timidly. My dear Carrie, said Miss Price reprovingly. We have progressed a little since the Middle Ages. Method and proletics have revolutionised modern witchcraft. Carrie felt Miss Price was quoting from a book and she longed to know a little more. Could I just see lesson one? she asked. Miss Price glanced quickly at a pile of old folders on an upper shelf and then she shook her head. I'm sorry, Carrie, this course is absolutely confidential. Any infringement of this regulation, she quoted, entails a fine of not less than £200 and condemns the offender to chronic progressively recurring attacks of cosmic creepers. Paul looked pensive. It's cheaper to spit on a bus, he announced after some seconds of silent thought. Gradually, the children discovered other treasures. A chart on which the signs of the zodiac were neatly touched up by Miss Price in watercolour. A sheep skull, a chocolate box full of dried mice, herbs in bunches, a pot of growing hemlock and one of the witch's bane. A small stuffed alligator which hung by two wires from the ceiling. What are alligators used for Miss Price? asked Paul. Again, Miss Price's long training in thoughtfulness overcame her longing to impress. Nothing much, she said. They're out of date now. I like to have it there for the look of it. It does look nice, Paul agreed rather enviously. He stuck his hands into his pockets. I had a dead hen once, he said carelessly, but Miss Price did not hear him. She was arranging three hazel twigs on a shelf in the form of a triangle. In the centre of this, she set the bed knob. Now pass me that red notebook just by your hand, Carrie. The one marked Spells Elementary? No, dear, the one marked Spells Advanced Various. Really, Carrie, Miss Price exclaimed as Carrie passed her the book. Can't you read? This is six easy curses for beginners. Oh, I'm sorry, cried Miss Carrie quickly and looked again. This is it, I think. Miss Price took the book. She put on her spectacles and spent some time gazing at the open page. Picking up a pencil, she scribbled a few figures on a piece of paper. She stared at these and then she rubbed them out with the other end of the pencil. Miss Price, began Paul, don't interrupt me murmured Miss Price. Hellebore, henbane, aconite, glowworm, fire and firefly light. Better pull down the blinds, Carrie. The blinds, Miss Price? Yes, over the window. We shan't be able to see this experiment. Carrie pulled down the blinds and adjusted them. And as the room came dark, Miss Price exclaimed, Now, isn't that pretty? She sounded surprised and delighted. 
The children crowded round her and saw that the bed knot glowed with a gentle light, pale as early dawn. As they watched, Miss Price twisted the bed knob a little, and the pale light turned to rose. There, you see, Miss Price said triumphantly. What's wrong with that? I'd like to know. Pull up the blinds again, Carrie. Carrie rolled up the blinds, and Miss Price slipped on the up an elastic band around the three hazel twigs and tied up the notebooks. Come along, she said cheerfully, opening the door. The spell works perfectly. Better than I hoped. I can't imagine where you went wrong. They followed Miss Price up the stairs, down the passage, and out through the open door into the garden, where the air was sweet and the smells of sun warmed the earth. Butterflies bowed precariously on the spheres of lavender and bumblebees hung in the foxglove bells. A milkman's cart stopped at the gate where there was a clang of bottles. Thank you ever so much, said Carrie. We'll try it again this evening. I did just what you said. I didn't screw it tight in tight at all. I... You? said Miss Price. You did it, Carrie. Yes, I did it myself. I was very careful. I... But Carrie, said Miss Price, I gave the spell to Paul. You mean Paul should have? Of course Paul should have done it. No wonder it didn't work. Slowly, wonderingly, a grin of ecstasy began to sh stretch itself across Paul's face. His eyes gleamed moistly with an almost holy joy. Carrie and Charles looked at him as though they had never seen him before. Well? said Miss Price rather sharply. Charles found his voice. He saw the young, he pointed out, for so much responsibility. But Miss Price was firm. The younger the better, as I know to my own cost. Now run along, children. She turned away, but almost immediately she turned back again, lowering her voice. Oh, by the way, I mean to tell you something else. You know I said the spell was better than I'd hoped. Well, if you twist it one way, the bed will take you where you want, in the present. Twist it the other way, and the bed will take you back into the past. Oh, Miss Price, exclaimed Carrie. What about the future? asked Charles. Miss Price looked at him as the bus conductor looks when you ask for a ticket to a place off the bus route. Charles blushed and turned up the gravel with the toe of his shoe. Now remember what I said, went on Miss Price. Have a good time, keep to the rules, and allow for the bed. She turned to the milkman, who had been waiting patiently by the step. Half a pint, please, Mr Bithelwaite, and my butter. And that was the end of chapter three of um, the Magic Bed Knob, part of the Bed Knobs and Broomsticks series. So there's a couple of good pictures in that one too, that I will share. So there's a nice one inside the room with Miss Price. And there's another little one of the alligator from the ceiling. So anyone who's a fan of the, the film that uh, was made of, of the series, which obviously is a combination, will probably have noticed a few little bits put in there, which was really quite cute. Um, in the film, you see Miss Price on the broomstick, holding one hand onto the broomstick, one hand onto her hat, which is obviously mentioned in the book, um, which is really nice. And then, obviously, the fact that Paul gets the bed knob too is part of the movie. And the children's personalities also come through, even if their circumstances are a little bit different. So, I really hope you enjoyed that reading. So, this is the bed knobs and broomsticks Mary Norton version with the kind of cotton cover, which is quite nice actually, you can't really see it, but like, it's like a nice little material there. And the purple ribbon. And the illustrations were by Anthony Lewis. Thank you for listening. Bye, see you next week. Oh, bye from Pooh.